Sure, we could do that. I'm an academy instructor out of Sioux Falls. Um, I was wondering if there's any discussion on how the job is going to be advertised moving forward. I have a lot of people come through the class who, it's, you know, CCA job is advertised as a part-time job, uh, and they that's what they're thinking they're getting, and then they're told they're working 12 plus hours, or on the other end of the spectrum, uh, they're looking for full time, and they may see it's part time and completely pass it up, and maybe they'd be a great carrier. So yeah. whatever the job is going into, whether it's going to be CCA or, or something different, is there any discussion on that? Yeah, we've talked about that. We've actually talked about that for years um, as it relates to trying to address staffing problems. Um, in some places, that's of course, has a bigger impact than others. If you're on you know, Long Island, for example, where we have problems hiring anybody, you know, any sort of misleading statement in it's such a competitive market, I mean, your point's well taken, but it, it can be very extreme in some cases. So, yes, we've talked about that. We've talked about, you know, getting to the point where if you get enough applicants to change the screening process, and there's a lot of different things. The one thing that's, a, I'll be honest, it's a little bit of a trick challenge for us. Um, they typically listen to us about stuff like this, but technically, we don't really have any say on what happens until somebody gets hired. <laughs> so, you know, that's always, I can't go as head first into that type of stuff. But uh, when it does translate into affecting stuff like staffing, that's when it you know, really becomes a conversation. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Morning, Greg. Hey, Corey Grady, Grand Sim, 20 Eagle Clear, Wisconsin. Question I had for you is because when we started this on Wednesday, you know, there was a show of hands of how many new people have been here. This is the first time and whatnot. Let's talk about the arbitration process. Arbitrator Dolan, Dolan is the one that's picked to be the neutral arbitrator, but the NALC has an arbitrator, USPS has an arbitrator. Do all three sit in on all discussions, but only uh, Nolan makes a, exactly how does that work? Yeah, I think I talked about this earlier, but I'll um, I'll kind of briefly run through it. So, yeah, there are three arbitrators, a panel. The neutral is the chair. The neutral is, is Arbitrator Nolan. Then the Post Service will have an arbitrator, and we have an arbitrator. Ours is um, one of our longtime attorneys named Keith Secular. And they all three hear everything, you know, as a panel. Um, they meet kind of behind closed doors. And the primary role of the NALC, the Post Service Arbitrator, is to be 100% sure that the neutral chair understands and is very clear on each party's positions on whatever the issue may be. Ultimately, the neutral is the person that makes the decision. Normally, the way it plays out is if there's an award issue, normally over the course of the process, multiple, you start with an initial proposal, things are then prioritized, there are more proposals that are narrowed down, so to speak, and ultimately the arbitrator is going to get to a point where he's going to decide one way or the other. Typically what happens is you'll see at the end of an award, you got a three-person panel, the neutral writes the award, one side or the other will basically agree with the award, and one side or the other will disagree. So you don't always see that. Sometimes all three will, will concur or agree. Uh, but that's basically the way that it plays out. So I heard all that, and I guess this is gonna draw into when Nolan comes back from vacation and, and gives dates. Does he give dates and then the other two arbitrators have to clear their schedule? Or no, those to... other two arbitrators, they work for us. Okay. Yeah, like our arbitrator, like he works in our building full time. He has for 44 years. So, cool. yeah, no, it's, it's not That's like that. Okay. No, it's just no, Nolan will give us dates. And, and I'll tell you, this is not, for an arbitrator, this is like the biggest gig there is. It's like the Super Bowl for an arbitrator. So, you know, his availability. As long as he's in the country, he's not going to be a problem. I mean, it, it literally is, it's, it's time it is by far the largest 
collective bargaining agreement that's decided in interest arbitration as far as the number of people it affects. And, and to be honest with you, when we go through the process with the post service of choosing an arbitrator, that's part of the consideration. You know, what you go, like we'll sometimes look at our regional panels and you don't want somebody that's going to be overwhelmed by the sheer, by the numbers. I mean, it, that really is a thing. That's a piece of this. So, uh, but anyway, they will prioritize it. So he's, um, and he's pretty, he's usually pretty, but like he gives us way more dates and rights arbitration than we ever used and we don't have that many cases nationally. So he'll, it becomes a priority. It's a big deal for him. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yep. In your opening speech, uh, the negotiations, I believe I recall you talking about contract compliance at the local level and our, our need for there to be more compliance mm -hmm. because it's just out of control. Has there been any uh, progress on that as far as management doing what the contract uh, or being held to a higher standard to do what the contract says? Yeah, um, I mean, we there's a number of things. One is what I talked about with you know PRT and all that joint communication earlier. Um, there also is stuff some is existing task forces that we we'll use and we've modified. Um, others are some new things that we've negotiated. For a long time, we've tried to negotiate additional kind of avenues to address stuff. Um, those have had varying degrees of success. I mean, some of them have, I mean, some of them have been successful in some places and not others. So uh, the more opportunity we can give for us to address it, better but th we have spent a significant amount of time talking about it uh, there will be some new stuff um, but I, I don't want to give anybody a kind of false you know, you know, illusion here we can't control what other human beings do and in many ways as frustrating as things like non-compliance and same agreements over and over again it's like why we exist as a union too um, and there's never going to be a substitute for taking them, you know, behind the woodshed in a grievance procedure. Like that's always going to be the primary thing that we do. It's a matter of us looking, you know, for other additional ways to address it. But yeah, we have spent a significant amount of time. Hey, it's me again. <laughs> a question on the Rob adjustments. <laughs> um, you talked about revamping. Section two of the M41. Now, no, get rid of it. Not, not get rid of it, but uh, no, get rid of it. Get rid of it. If we have a joint process, chapter two is gone. Okay, that was the question because yeah. that on the tick and talk and read it and the Facebook and all these other things <laughs> that uh, you know that would take away the 271G if you're revamping. That would. Yeah. So okay, we would just write whatever we wanted. That's what we we write whatever we wanted special route inspection to be. You know, it could be a lot of things. We've talked about a lot of stuff. It could be a um, kind of automatic review that happens and hits that certain criteria. It could still be incumbent upon the carrier to request it. Um, post service is, this is not often used in practicality and in reality, but they're always interested in 271B, you know. So um, we would more than likely just write whatever we wanted it to be in the agreement itself. Michelle Beers at uh, Branch 957 with Mark North Dakota. Uh, a question I hear on, a lot on the subject of the next gen delivery vehicles. Probably the one we're all wondering is what's that rollout going to look like? We want to know when are they coming? Who gets them first? Is that city versus rural? How is it decided? Where they go first? Um, the only thing I can tell you that I know for sure is they're going to go to the SNDCs first. The reason I know that is because that's where they've installed the infrastructure for the electric for the charging. That's what they've started with, which makes sense because those places are big. They got space. Um, after that, we will know at some point, some level of we'll have some level of advance notice. Um, long term, city rural city's going to get most of them. In the SNDCs where they also have rural, they'll probably go ahead and give them the rural too. But they're they're not going to go to give them to a bunch of rural cares before us. I feel sure of that. 
Hey, Brian. Hey. Pat Van Egren, 2619 Green Bay. Uh, connect some of the dots here. You, we've talked about rod adjustments, possible permanent solution there, um, maybe doing away with M39 and 41. Uh, we know that of the multiple dose levels that exist, and no, we don't acknowledge it, but uh, any discussion on incorporating a way if there's a new program like that for road adjustments in connection to the daily walk around or the magic eight ball session that they like to play every day with us uh, with their estimation program and trying to eliminate some of that bullshit, quite frankly. Yeah, um, within the context of us talking about You know what a route adjustment process would look like. It brings into it brings a lot of other stuff in. For example, fixed office time, casing standards. You know, I am zero interest in looking deeply at fixed office time for what they're going to do in a joint in a in a you know unilateral environment. But in a joint environment, I think probably most people would agree. If we're being honest about it. It's not that our fixed office time is too little, but the way the minimum line items are, they don't reflect the reality anymore. You know, for example, line 15, not a lot of people use line 15 anymore. And we probably use a lot more on stuff like 21, you know, that's recurring, that's not, stuff we don't have control of. So um, that is, becomes part of the conversation. A big part of the conversation is also exactly what you mentioned. So we've, you know, got the DOA settlements. Um, they have since then come up with a couple of other things. A big piece of what I have tried to stress to them is we go out here and jointly adjust these routes. And we get them adjusted. What I don't want to happen is you come up with some new BS to just cause more problems. Um, I don't, I feel reasonably certain they're not going to come up with something new. I think they're, well, I know, they're putting all their time and resources into trying to come up with tools like a new core or whatever they call that thing. I can't miss it. So, um, but we are definitely um, looking to do some small things like language-wise and what would be the agreement that would address some of that. Good question. Joel Tracy, Branch 114, Duluth. Um, sort of on that vein, I know the office tension, there was some national programs in the past that JWIP, the Joint Workplace Improvement Program, to deal with some of those worst offices where they're the most bullying and harassing for management. Is there any talk at national? I haven't heard much about JWIP since it was first done a little bit. I know Chris Wittenberg was involved with that, but is there any talk about the national addressing of, of some of those worst offices and that, yeah. that bad behavior for management? Yeah, you, you'll, you're going to see a, um, this will be the case regardless of how we achieve the agreement, significant changes to that MOU. Um, basically the changes are to allow, partially based on like lessons we learned and what we've done with it previously. It's one of those that we had some success in some places, some places not so much. Um, but the idea is to be able to reach many more places and kind of drive it down a little more local. Um, which, frankly, if you look historically, some of the other things we've had, like route adjustment started like that, where it was a very national thing, and then what you know we learned and then moved it down. So, uh, but JWIP will will change significantly. Similarly to the contract compliance thing, um, we are always looking for additional ways to address that type of stuff on the workroom floor, but. Um, Nothing's ever going to replace the grievance procedure. That's you know always going to be front and center. But uh, I, I am pretty happy, and frankly, I was just among us in this room, just slightly surprised that they agreed to some of the stuff they did with JWIP. So um, it'll be different, that's for sure. There, there's no doubt that uh, um, I think it'll give us an opportunity to reach more places. You know, it's just a matter of staying on top of it. I wanted to tell you, you're doing a good job. I heard about your story a little bit. Hello, it was 
Hey, my name is Felicia. I'm with Rich Peel, Minnesota. I want to commend you. You are not a alcoholic anymore. Um, oh, yeah, I, little, I always I don't want to embarrass you. I've been sober over 11 months, but oh, I'm still an alcoholic. Good. Oh, let me answer this question. I can't, nobody's asked this yet. There will be back pain. I promise you. If there's not back pain, something went horribly wrong. Um, and just to give a little uh, context to that, just a second. So with the colas so far that we have, quote, missed, um, that will, you know, there's a 99% chance to be paid retroactively. The cola from last July was $977. From January, is 354 The cola um, from just the very first month, that will be paid in July, so it just includes the, the first month after the release, is $333, and there's five more months to go. So, like, the COLAs are gonna be significant. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, whatever general increases and however the whole thing works out that I talked about with the new pay scale, they'll, they'll be with you, for sure. Yes, ma'am. Aaron Blazovic, Ranch 114, Duluth, Minnesota. Um, I touched on this with uh, Brother Mitchell yesterday, but um, USPS is one of the largest, if not the largest, federal civilian workforce, and we are not included in the federal paid parental leave. Is there any push to get that? Because I want to have kids, and I'd like to be able to do it knowing that I'm not going to lose my job yeah. and have the ability to not work and care for them for the first few months. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, um, is there a push? The answer is yes. That is something that is 100% on the table in collective bargaining. So let me just give a touch of history without getting terribly deep, but this is um, fairly new for the feds, the rest of them, um, within the last several years. We, unfortunately, in, I think it was 2018, I think, were basically carved out of it by by the then um, leadership. Uh, the White House, I think, had a lot to do with that. So we have looked for a lot of opportunities to, obviously, if we could do it legislatively, the Postal Service has to do it, and it's not something that we've got to, you know, quote, give up and bargain or pay for, you know what I mean? So, but honestly, I am not at the point where I'm interested in waiting around to do it any longer legislatively. Um, I think it's a simple matter of morality, in my opinion. And, um, you know, the fact is, the idea of someone, it's basically the position you're put in is you have to use sick leave. You know, someone having to use sick leave to have a baby is absurd. They're not sick, they're having a baby, a child. So um, that is a big topic in, in bargaining. We've talked a lot about it. We've not come to agreement on it yet. There's a very strong possibility that um, that could be part of it, just arbitration for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, oh, gentleman first. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> nope. Nope. Uh, Tom Nickerson, uh, Branch 2942, Lord Hopkins. Um, so I was just curious if there's any uh, talk in these negotiations and about changing some of the language in the contract to include more packages and parcel terms. They've been running us over the coals on a lot of that stuff, whether it be from our daily conversations, from start times, from all of that. If, we're, if they're gonna compare us to package handlers, we don't have a lot of language in our contract that says package handlers. Um, so, we have had a lot of discussion about the changing environment, how things have changed. A lot of it is, is you know, as you might imagine, with the changes that they're making in that direction. 
Um, as far as changes in our national agreement, uh, I don't know that there's a lot off the top of my head that would need to change. I do think, however, there is a fairly significant amount of possible changes that could be improvements in the Postal Service's handbooks and manuals that are covered by Article 19 of our agreement. Um, mostly the M41. Uh, there's some stuff in there that's outdated. That's the book that's in our case, you know, um, that tells us what to do or how to do our job. There's a lot of stuff in there that's outdated, and we have had a lot of conversation with them about potential modifications um, as a result of we do the, this route adjustment on a permanent basis and the, the changing environment. So I think there are some things that you could probably see in the future. Um, but as far as in this round of negotiations, there's nothing significant that we've agreed on you know, that, that, that would substantively change what we do as far as the way we deal with parcels. Aaron Ledoux, uh, Branch 125, Final Life, Wisconsin. Um, mine's basically about the food drives. So this year, uh, there's a big discussion about the car. Um, what the was little bitty car? Correct, the yeah. ones that we're gonna get uh, eventually um, put in mailboxes. Um, I guess what was behind the change this year was a financial issue. Um, and then also, why weren't branches given the opportunity to say that their rural carriers were involved before they weren't, you know, we weren't allowed, I guess, that opportunity first, um, and then we'd have to get a rural carrier on board, et cetera, et cetera, so that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, so let me, the short answer to your question is everything you pointed out is legitimate needs to be fixed and will be fixed in 2025. Um, the food drive is in a really odd place, but it's also at a place of you know, pretty significance in terms of the future. We basically picked up the last two years half the amount of food that we picked up on average prior to the pandemic. The national partners, which is where a lot of the resources to buy stuff like cards come from, we spend a lot of money on, um, but there's also a significant amount of the resources for the cards and stuff like that that comes from the national partners. Some of that was kind of slow to come in this year. Um, so we had to make sort of tough decisions. I am 100% and certainly NLC is, you know, financially we're in a very good place um, overall. But I also, you know, am not going to throw $10 million at a, a food drive, right? Not for a single year. So what I've done is we've taken sort of a more long term view. Um, one of the things that we changed that or Fred did was president is he shifted the food drive in a in my opinion a very positive direction from being something that was kind of heavily corporate sponsored you all remember Campbell soup was a huge part and they tried to take it over we had to get rid of uh, we still have a corporate presence you know CBS who is not they're certainly very corporate but we have a close relationship with them Kellogg's has been really good but a large part of the support was shifted to labor. You know, we have a lot of union support. UFCW gives us you know, a lot of money every year. The AFL-CIO is a, a big partner. So we actually had an AFL-CIO executive council meeting last week, and that the executive council of the AFL-CIO is the um, basically like the 47 biggest union presidents presidents of the 47 biggest unions. So I'm on the executive council. Then we have what's called an executive committee, which is just like the 12 presidents. Um, and I'm on the executive committee too. And in both of those 
forums, um, I told them, I explained basically that, that, look, our food drive is at a crossroads. We want to keep it very labor focused, but we also want to grow back to the impact that we had pre-pandemic. But in order for us to do that, it takes money and um, it takes support. So we followed that up with letters that I think went out today to all of those unions to hopefully have them begin to support, much like we support a lot of their causes. Um, and then as we look forward to next year, the focus is on resources, but translating that directly into bags, cars, but things that we get a significant return on. Um, the rural carrier piece, so the, the rules have a, um, a new president. He's been president for a few months now, but um, I have talked to him about this some, and you know, I said, look, man, we're gonna put your logo on this food drive thing as a national partner. I don't wanna hear nothing about, oh, we got 20 rural offices to participate. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do it everywhere. Um, so I'm kind of working on him uh, about that. I think he agrees with me in principle. Getting his people to do it's a whole another, a whole another thing. So you know, the hay's kind of in the barn for this year. Um, to be quite honest, I don't expect us to, you know, make any significant jump in terms of what we pick up from last year. I do expect next year to look. A lot different um, in terms of the cards and, and those cards are pitiful. Those little pieces of paper like a business card. And they used to be, you know, big. So um, we will. I'm confident we're going to get the food drive back to where it was. You know, it just takes the support. And you guys know nothing in the world works more than bags and car. And that's it. Like that's. I want to direct our resources there. So that's what I've asked the other units to help us with. We'll obviously, you know, put up a lot of support. But frankly, this year we we purchased what we could with the resources that were there. Um, so anyhow, next year uh, I'm hopeful that it'll it'll look a lot different. And I don't and not to be dismissive of this year. It's just that's you know, reality. Before I uh, shut up and you guys go home, um, the most important thing I can say from here today, and you all have listened to me for hours now, um, is to express my appreciation, and more importantly, the appreciation of our members 